right, John. Uh, happy Sunday morning. It's uh, true to the entrepreneur uh, mentality. It's Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and you and I are uh, recording a chat. So good ready morning. to go. <laughs> Long time listener, first time guest. Glad to be here. Hey, hey, we're glad to have you. Gosh, <laughs> I'm delinquent on that. Well, hey, I think it'd be helpful just for folks to hear a little bit about what Homebase does. And maybe you could also wind back the clock a little bit to how you and Rushi came to start the company. And then we'll jump ahead a little bit to where we are today. Yeah. So to start, we are the largest team management app for local businesses. So we help over 100,000 small businesses, well over 2 million workers manage their work. And that's everything from scheduling to time tracking, communication, hiring, payroll, uh, access to their pay. It is everything they need to streamline work, to make that work experience better, to hire and retain workers uh, for small businesses. And perhaps worth noting that 55% of Americans work for a small business. It's 42% of US GDP. So uh, you and I both share a passion and a love for small businesses in America. And I should mention, uh, as you know, Chelsea and I wrote an article recently just pointing out that we've had 15 million small business applications in the last three years, which is a record. And I think, you know, my personal view is some of why we have such record low unemployment in America right now is people have decided to opt out and go start their own business, which I think is awesome. And it'll be great energy for you guys and everybody else in the SMB tech for, you know, probably decades to come. Yeah. You know, I think this is one thing you and I bonded over from our very first meeting. You know, I remember, I, I remember uh, meeting up in COVID and just feeling the conviction in that very, very hard time for small businesses around uh, what was going to be on the other side. You know, what, what was going to happen on main streets everywhere, local businesses. And that's the type of small business we serve, you know, restaurant, retail, health and beauty, uh, dog groomers, optometrists, you know, full range of local businesses. And the thing that I, you know, that a hundred percent, we were kind of uh, both just felt so passionately about was the role these businesses play in their communities and in job creation and kind of the core of the U S economy. I think now I think about it even more in terms of even at record low unemployment, you know, the thing that I think about for the next 50 years is not just, hey, are there jobs, but are there good jobs? Uh, and that's something that I also think Excuse small me. businesses provide uniquely well. You know, these aren't these aren't just jobs. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned, I think you and I met for the first time, we had a beer in my backyard, right? And that was like super uncool at the time. You weren't supposed <laughs> yeah. to meet anybody and- and you came out and we sat down and had a, had a beer in the afternoon. And that was that was pretty cool because that was like April or May, maybe like like still like peak fear around COVID. That was that was a crazy time. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's just it's so it feels like so long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet for our customers who went through it, it, it is just like that ring on the tree from a forest fire. That's like, it, it's always going to be there. You know, it's just, a, it's a mark in the business that's always there. I think for us as a company serving small business the same way, you know, it's, it, we're, we're hitting four year anniversary of COVID. And yet I think there's so much of the company that was formed there mm -hmm. uh, from a culture standpoint, from a operation standpoint, from a product standpoint, you know, it's just, it was, uh, yeah, just a, a unprecedented experience. And everybody's, I would argue, your customers and your company are more resilient because of that. I mean, you guys, I remember when we were heading into 23, I, I don't know if you remember this conversation, but it was like Q4 of 22. And I said, hey, John, what do you guys, how, how do you think a recession would impact our business? And you... <laughs> You said something like a recession, dude, we survived COVID. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you were I, like, I, you could throw anything at me and it's going to be easier than that. I, I think that's, I think that's real. You know, our, our customers got hit with just an unprecedented meteor in 2020. And I, again, it's like very hard to remember what it felt like at the time. But for us, April 13th, 2020, that day is burned in my mind. Two thirds of our customers were closed. You know, we lost a third of our customers in 2020. That was heartbreaking. You know, it, yes, it's like a statistical thing and it's a number, but, you yeah. know, what I remember is just the conversations with the business owners who I had gotten to know so well over the previous five years of building home base. You know, the businesses that helped us prototype different products that were giving us feedback that we were highlighting on our marketing site, you know, just advocates for home base and then hearing 
just the fear and anxiety in their voices that are going through that experience, you know, it'll never, ever leave me. Yeah. Uh, and it hasn't been a walk in the park since, you know, I think that's yeah. the other thing you think about local businesses is you, you think back to the labor shortage, you think to the inflation, all this stuff hits small businesses. So, uh, so directly, but you know, it's back to the thing that you and I love about small businesses is man, are they resilient and they come out of this and they're positive and they are gritty and they just keep going and they just keep finding new ways to serve is, I mean, for all of the hardship, it's also the most inspirational thing that you could hope for. So wind back the clock, what what brought you, what, what opportunity did you and Rushi see originally and maybe give folks a little bit of sense of when that was and sort of then we'll come back to today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were a number of things happening around the, the same time. Um, you know, Rushi and I have a couple things in common. So Rushi, my co-founder and I, we worked together at KKR. We were in the operating team there. We both spent a lot of time in that context, helping small businesses, working in small business focused companies. Uh, and so, you know, we already kind of had our love of small businesses. We kind of knew. When was this? What year? Like uh, that would have been like 2013, 20. Okay. 2011 to 2013, you know, my time going back in small business, even earlier than that, 20, 2009 to 2013. Uh, the other thing that Rushi and I have in common is we both have very good childhood friends who own and run restaurants. So, you know, I have a ton of Pacific Northwest pride, very proud, uh, very proud of my Seattle roots. Uh, Good friends from growing up were opening their first restaurant in 2013, and they were going through all of the challenges of building and managing a business for the first time. You know, they, these were true small business entrepreneurs who had never started a business before, were just passionate about healthy eating and wanted to open a restaurant. And I could see what they were going through, uh, where, where they had tools to help them in some parts of their business. But when it came to the team, they had nothing, you know, and they're just dealing with the incredible complications that come with building a team with managing the regulations, the operational complexity, if you have hourly workers, you know, just a huge, huge burden that falls on these local business teams without any tools to help them. Uh, at the same time, my sister was bartending uh, and working in restaurants up in Seattle and her life as an hourly worker looked no different than my life looked 10 years earlier. You know, she was still calling in to figure out when she was working. She was writing her hours down in a notebook to make sure she was getting paid correctly. You know, very, very basic quality of life stuff. Uh, and that was really the point of home base from the beginning. You know, it was never about scheduling. It was never about time tracking. It was never about one specific thing. It was the fact that you had effectively 20% of the U.S. workforce that really hadn't benefited from technology at all. And that was hugely impactful for managers and small business owners. It was also really impactful for the workers in those teams. And that's really what the, the starting point of home base was. So you and Rushi get together, you launch the business, you raise some capital from Cowboy, from Bain Capital, a few other folks. Uh, we connected. I, I, well, by the way, we both grew up in Bellevue, uh, as did Dave Vassin at Bright Wheels. So the, the yeah, SMB yeah. tech connection in, in Bellevue is strong. <laughs> a lot of SMB love coming from yeah. Bellevue, Washington. <laughs> So fast forward to 2020, we led we led a, a round of investment with you guys and, and, you know, have just been lucky to be along for the journey and watching you grow and, like you said, survive all the parts that are hard. And one of my passion topics is helping other entrepreneurs understand how frigging hard it is. Yeah. Um, but I also think it's interesting as a milestone, you guys have now been at it for nine, 10 years. Yeah. And uh, Rushi and I were together, as you know, uh, at a conference this week and hanging out and you know, we were just sort of like refresh reflecting on the fact that if you want to be a founder of a successful company you need to sign up for a very long journey and you know you and and Alir and Dave and so many other folks you know who I get to know in year five or six at year 10 are still building and hoping that they're building a public company that'll be around for a long time but I think that's a really important lesson for people to learn most yeah. great companies aren't built in two or three years. It takes a long time. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how you guys think about it? And then and then maybe one other tag along question of that is uh, you and I were talking in the fall about how do you keep motivating that team that you've got around you to reach greater and greater heights in year eight or 10? And so just maybe those two those two things together. 
Yeah, I think this is such a good question. I think this is one of those things that I reflect back on and just feel very fortunate. Uh, so, you know, now that I am 10 years in, I feel so lucky that I started a company not with a specific product or mind and anything like that, but because of a very specific mission and because of a love of a customer that we serve. And I think it, with that as the foundation, it's really easy for that to evolve over over time. And I talk about that now when, you know, it's funny to be on where I am as a founder and CEO. And I get early founders reaching out to me to have conversations and, and talk about this stuff. And I, that, that's the number one piece of advice I give is, you know, make sure that you're starting a company with a mission that you are really passionate about. I'm not a founder, I think, who could just start a business because it's a really good business idea. I don't think that, I don't think I could do that. I think there are people who could. But for me, having that mission that like you can keep going back to and that continues to evolve every single year, yeah. because there is the part that is very slow, which is, you know, there's stuff that we're doing from a product standpoint that we talked about nine years ago. It just takes a while. You know, there, there's just like some uh, methodical execution to it. But the other part of it is the mission can evolve too. You know, there's stuff that I'm excited about from a product standpoint and impact that we can have now that I could have never imagined nine years ago. And that's also really cool. You know, that, that to me is part of that thing that allows the team to keep being inspired. And we got people at home base who've been doing this for a long time, uh, who are still at the company and are still kind of energized about that core mission and excited about what we can do from a product standpoint because I think it was always about the customer rather than a product. And so I, love that. Uh, I, I think that served us really well, but yeah. you know, I'll tell you, Jeff, I think that there's something, I don't know if you remember this when, when, again, we were meeting in your backyard, you said something in that first meeting, which was uh, effectively, you know, small business focused founders are just built a little bit differently mm -hmm. I think uh, that's true. because of the patience required in serving small businesses. Uh, and I, I definitely agree with that too, you know, and I think about that, not just from my standpoint, from team standpoint, but I think about that from your standpoint and investor standpoint too, because we were very clear on, Hey, we're building, we're building towards this much larger vision, serving small businesses. And, you know, we had to have investors who supported that too. Uh, it's one so. of the biggest pieces of advice I give founders who are early in SMB tech is make sure you get people around you who are aligned on that. And I always use the example of uh, another company I'm involved in that you know, where the founder took uh, eight years to get to 5 million of ARR. And then in the next five, you went from five to 150. It's great, and, you know. but, if, but if he hadn't been willing to put in the eight years, he never would have gotten to where he is today. And now that business is crushing it. And, you know, we'll, we'll get to where you guys are as well. But like the good stuff comes five to 10 years down the road. But if you're not willing to grind it out and survive COVID and survive, you know, a recession or whatever comes your way. Cause it's a, it's a tough category to play in as well. You have to be really resilient. Yeah. I, I think that um, I think for a lot of SMB companies, and I would definitely say this for us, I think that revenue is a little bit more of a lagging indicator on the success of the business than in many other companies. You know, like if you think about enterprise and stuff like that, I just think it's more of a lagging indicator because, you know, we're a freemium company, you know, we're signing up, we're signing up customers today that, that actually won't pay us for like three years. Like, right. That's, that's but those, cool. but those cohort charts look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, the cohort, you know, Over time. They will, uh, yeah. Yeah. You got to have confidence. And now, you know, now at this stage of the journey, it's like, okay, there's a lot of embedded growth in what we do and we can kind of bring more, more products to these customers who have been using us and love home base. Uh, but you know, you got to get to that point. That's a, that was a slog for sure. So let me let me jump to you guys are announcing a financing. Yeah, uh, I would argue I've been in venture capital now for 16 years. I would argue this is the toughest market I've seen, certainly the toughest market I've seen since 08, 09. And I think even harder than that, because there are more companies looking for, you know, there's more capital than there was then. But there's also way more companies looking for capital. Can you talk a little bit about the fundraise and then how you I think a lot of folks would love to hear How'd you do it? How'd you approach it? What was key to the pitch? Uh, yeah. We'll get into all those details, but like I get a lot of, you know, I've sent you a number of founders who've come to me and said, Hey, I want to raise capital in 2024. And I said, we should talk to John because he just ran the gauntlet and it was not easy, but pulled off a very successful fundraise. So let's talk about it. Yeah. So I guess the first question in there is 
why why did we choose to raise money during a very very hard time to raise money i think that there was the ambition of the company in this which is we have always been super clear on what we're building towards long term uh, and that we want to be aggressive from a product standpoint we want to be aggressive from an impact in our customers lives standpoint uh i view the I just think we're at an inflection point right now where we're going through the most profound shift in the labor markets that we're ever going to live through. Uh, and that's going to cut across every part of the economy, but it's also going to cut across hourly work and shift-based work and small business work. Uh, and I want to make sure that we're shaping that in a positive way. Uh, and so we need to be really aggressive in what we're doing from a product standpoint in order to bring a better version of work to hourly workers, to make sure that small businesses can compete and have scale advantages in the in the way that they can hire and manage workers, too. Uh, so we, we want to make sure that the, the playing field isn't just level, but it's tilted towards small businesses. And, and that's going to require investment. So, you know, I'm very excited that we were able to find investors who kind of got that. And in this environment of kind of efficiency and all of that, which we certainly take very seriously, you know that. Uh, but to be on a path where it felt like, okay, we can continue to invest in building and product and doing the things that we want to do. Now, uh, from a process standpoint, I think the other part of this was, you know, we had investors who had been kind of following along for a while. Uh, and over the course of 2023, kind of leaning in a little bit to show, hey, we're, we're doing our own work on the side. Uh, we're talking to customers. We're doing market evaluations, things like that. Uh, and that that did two things for me, I think, as a, as a founder in that, which was one, made me confident that, um, okay, there are folks that are leaning in and kind of we can we can lean in a little bit too to test the process, but two, that there were investors who were bringing in real conviction around what we're doing as a company. That, that's like the most important thing for me in raising money is just having convicted investors. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, that's like a good starting point, <laughs> I guess. Those are kind of like- Well, I, the, think, I think maybe just to clarify, so- you know, you had a number of folks that had known you for nine months or longer before you ever came to them in the fall about the fundraise. And I think it's a really important lesson. A lot of founders think that they can just flip a switch, go pitch somebody and get term sheets, you know, two weeks later. And I always say to folks like, first of all, why would you want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to have the chance to get to know somebody over time? And then to your point, see what kind of conviction they have on the business, on the category, on the industry. But but these folks had had known you, you'd given them financial plans, which you would then hit or, or beat. Uh, talk about how important that was, that trust that you had built with them over time. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for sure, I think that there was a lot that was working in our favor, you know, that we're serving a giant market. I think people understood that. I think people understood the magnitude of the opportunity. I think people understood our leadership position in the in this. Um, I think all of that was true. Also, I think people could look at the company over the last three years and say, hey, this company and their customers really got hit by something catastrophic. And yet the customers continued to use the product and grow with the product and take more from home base. You know, you want to... You want to understand if your product is important to your customers, go through that. You want to understand if like you're a mission driven company focused on kind of executing against that, go through that. So I think we had a lot of that working in our favor. I think what you're saying is right. We also had, by the time we were fundraising, we had 10 months of results to show, hey, we set out a plan for this year and we are executing against it every single month. You know, we were we were on plan across the business and that was both making sure that we were growing, that was making sure that we were improving the efficiency of the business. It was launching product, you know, it was across the board, just showing that like, hey, we were gonna do the things that we said we were gonna do. Uh, and I, I think that was a great thing in this environment to be able to point to that and for those investors to have the confidence, you know, that the things that we were talking about in January or February when we're first catching up, which, you know, now we're a year from. So to all the founders, like, now's the time, uh, lay, the, lay, lay the groundwork for the fall, uh, have those conversations, and then just make sure you're 
focused on the thing that matters, which is building a great business for the next nine months. Yeah. And I would, I guess a couple of data points that I've shared with other folks as well, who've asked, I think you guys did a great job of laying out a five-year plan for the company and showing that we are building a, not a great business that's run well, that's capital efficient. We don't, you know, we don't burn an excessive amount of cash. Uh, and then using the data and the cohorts from the last couple of years to say, you know, this is a very achievable plan. The next five years we're laying out, we don't need magic to happen. We are going to achieve this plan. We're going to build a very successful public company. Talk a little about how you instilled that confidence in the folks that you spent time with in the fundraising process. Yeah, well, I think first off in that, when we're talking about the historical performance, it was always in the context of this is what the business looks like with incredible headwinds. You know, we This has been an incredible yeah, good point. <laughs> time for our customers and this is how we've performed. Yeah. And I think for us to say, like, we'd like to believe that at some point these headwinds are going to turn into tailwinds, but that's not really baked into our plan. You know, what you have to believe is that we're going to continue to execute against the things that we know how to do and have kind of shown that we can do. I think the other thing that we did was, you know, we spent a lot of time at board meetings talking about the really exciting things that we're going to do from a product standpoint. You know, what the 10 year vision of home base is. That's not really what we anchored the fundraise to. You know, the fundraise yeah. was about the here's the things that we have launched. Here's how these are going to grow. Here's how we're kind of executing against known opportunities. There was always the thing about the bigger vision. And this is how we become a hundred billion dollar company and, and how we are a generational company shaping work for tens of millions of people. But that was not really that was not really the thing that we wanted people to have to believe. What we wanted them to have to believe was we could just kind of continue to do the things that we were doing today. Yeah, yeah. So I always think of it as sort of like, <clears throat> this is the baseline plan we're going to execute on. And by the way, there is a much bigger opportunity we're going after. And I always think of it as sort of like what LinkedIn did for, you know, white collar professional workers were in some ways we're organizing you know, the hourly workforce, the merchants, the SMBs, we're making them more powerful, more effective, allowing them to compete with the bigger chains and other folks that they compete with. And it's a pretty, you know, like back to the point of being excited for the next 10 years. Yeah. I think that aspirational vision is pretty awesome. Yeah. And that's where it's, you know, for me, energy wise, 10 years in, it's like, okay, 10 years in and, and we're just turning page one. Yeah. Right. You know, I think about everything that we've done to this point just to earn the opportunity to do the things over the next stage of the company. Like yeah. So much hard work to go into this point, but kind of wasn't the point. The point was what we get to do from here. And I think that's the part around the patience and in, in building a company uh, that we we're you know, talking about earlier. Yeah. I guess, you know, so home just to give folks a sense of scale, Homebase is a company that hopefully can go public. I don't know, 25, 26, 27, somewhere in that in that zip code. Any advice that you have for early stage founders on, you know, building the company to where you are today, board, investors, just kind of some of the inside baseball that founders might help, help, help you know, be, benefit from learning from you? Yeah, I think... Uh, I'm sure that's a long list, by the way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's I like, mean, how much could, time do we have? We yeah. could spend a half hour on any yeah. of those. You yeah. know? I think that there are a few things that I, I believe in the uh, core of my bones now, maybe as a founder, uh, and in no particular order. Uh, one, make sure you have a mission that you're going to be excited about 10 years from now you know, more than anything, that's the thing that for me, I think allows me to build and uh, build a team here, allows me to kind of keep everybody excited or allows us to have such great people at home base. For, for me, that's kind of the foundation of everything is the mission uh, to make sure you are surrounding yourself with people who are equally convicted in that. And, you know, when I think about investors, like to me, that's number one. Uh, but I think that's also true when you think about the team members that you're bringing into it. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't believe in having tourists on the team. You know, you want people who are fully bought into the mission because there will be really hard times that are going to challenge, not just kind of what you're doing in the short term, but also the conviction around those long-term things and the investments mm -hmm. you're making. And I think having everybody really bought into that, not at an 
at an intellectual level, but at an emotional level, it's really important. Uh, you know, I think the now just, yeah, maybe, maybe the third thing that I think we talk about now more than ever is, uh, I really think that great products in particular in the SMB world is ultimately about the feeling they create. Uh, and I think that that's a really easy thing to lose track of the more, the longer you've been building product, the further you are on your roadmap is, you know, the thing that's great about SMBs is you can help them solve real problems, but also they don't give a shit about your ROI calculations. You know, that's not the way they make <laughs> no, decisions. They don't. Right. Uh, you know, so don't forget that like ultimately great software creates a feeling. And I think that's one thing that we've also taken. It's a great lesson. Quickly. Yeah. I think it's also one of the reasons why some enterprise companies struggle to go down market. They don't realize that it's not just a customer using a product. It's they're literally running their business with your technology. Yeah, I think it's I think it's so easy to get lost in the featured checklists and comparing to other products in the market and all of that when if you go back to why do people choose you, it's because you've made their life easier. Uh full stop, you yeah. know, and that that's a feeling as much as anything else. Yeah. And so for us, you know, we take ease of use so, so seriously here. Uh we, I think that's one of the benefits we had on being a freemium product from the beginning is we were just so uh, disciplined on making sure that we had a product that was going to be easy to use, that people loved using. Yeah. So let me ask you, uh, it's unscripted, so there was no prep here. Yeah. So uh, a, a fireball question, but you know, you've been doing this now for 10 years. Where is home base 10 years from now? So I get this, I get this question a lot. You know, we do town oh, hall do? <laughs> company. I do it in interviews. Well, the team's smarter than I am, that's for sure. No, no, you know, yeah. I think the thing that I think about and I genuinely think about is I don't think about the success of the company in terms of IPO. I don't think about it even in terms of the scale of the number of customers we serve. You know, all of those things are inputs. 10 years from now, I would like to be able to measure the impact of home base in the US unemployment rate. You know, that is my goal on a 10 year time horizon. Now, right now, that feels like we're at a very low moment in unemployment. That's great. But you can peel that back. And again, I think the quality of the job really matters. But there's also so much kind of structural friction that exists here. Mm -hmm. And it is the challenges of finding and managing, managing teams. It is the disconnected, you know, somebody's childcare or school schedule changes, and they have to go find another job as a result. It, it is just the back and forth that happens when you're trying to hire somebody uh, and you're trying to match availability and things like that. You know, there's still just a lot of structural friction that exists in this part of the world. Uh, and I think on a 10 year horizon, I think we can make such a big impact in just how this world of local business work operates that we can right. measure impact in the unemployment rate. So that's, that's 10 cool. years from now. That's, yeah. that's the goal. Yeah. Even if you just think about such a huge percentage of your customer base has a, you know, I wouldn't call it transient, but has a workforce that has a lot of turnover. Right. And, you know, if they're missing somebody in a particular role for two or three months, that's huge. Well, it's hard to go find those people. It's hard to get the right people. It's hard to find people who are motivated and want to be part of your particular small business. And if you can create liquidity and take the friction out of that, Ooh, be good for it. Be good for maybe we can measure it in uh, home base's impact on GDP. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I think that that's true because yeah. uh, you know, you and I know small businesses are the biggest employers and job creators in this country. I think that's only more true over the next decade. I, than I, I, I hope you're right. Decade. I think you're. I think you're right, and I hope you're right. Yeah. So we really need small businesses to be successful. But and there's this virtuous cycle, which is if small businesses can hire, then they can grow and expand and then they can hire more. And they don't just do it creating kind of transactional gig work. They they do it creating jobs where there's development, where there is opportunity, where there's community, where there's learning. All of these things that we should want for our communities, small businesses provide. And so, you know, that, that's what I hope for in that GDP impact. You know, it's not just jobs, it's good jobs, it's healthy communities. It's all of these things that small businesses provide. Well, uh, I'm inspired by that. I'm glad to be along for the ride. I'm going to be here in 10 years, uh, whether you like it or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we'll be talking about how are we measuring that GDP? Exactly, impact. exactly. So. <laughs> 
uh, we're we're thrilled to be part of the company, John. And uh, it's been uh, it's fun. It's kind of fun reminiscing back to that time grabbing the beer in my backyard. Uh, yeah, and just just been fun to watch you guys. You know, not only survive but thrive the last few years. I think that that's been really um, rewarding for us as investors to see. You know, as you know, I'm involved in a lot of SMB tech companies, and to have so many that were almost put out of business in 2020 to come roaring back and, as you said, really create this like empowering uh, capability for their merchants. The merchants are thriving. Um, and I'm sure we'll have challenges that come along, you know, whether it's recessions or who, you know, God forbid another pandemic, but, yeah. but that resiliency, that ring on the tree that you talked about, I think is going to be, it's going to bode well for the next five to 10 years. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, I'm super appreciative for your support for the entire GGV Capital uh, su firm support. You know, it's it's been amazing to have uh, your all's help over this last stage of growth that we went through. And, you know, as importantly, it's been awesome to have your belief and conviction around what we can build from here. Just thank you, Jeff. We're all in. Yeah. Now go enjoy your Sunday. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> go Niners. <laughs> I was wondering if it was coming. <laughs> yeah. All right, John. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Take care.